What is up, my fellow Chibits? Today, I'm here to bring all of you the weekly manga chapter review of Boku no Hero Academia. Now, before I get into the review, there's been one thing that many have been discussing for the past few days, and I've been meaning to make a video on it, but it kind of just got pushed to the side because I've been a little bit busy with the Battlefield 1 beta and also been busy with the Attack on Titan game, so I kind of was like, you know what, I'll just wait until the chapter of Boku no Hero Academia comes out until I decide to, you know, discuss it, and I won't be as angry or rage-induced, which I'm still kind of a little bit pissed off, but you know what, I'm going to talk about it. So, if you did not hear, there was an article that was released very recently about the top five or the worst female characters of Weekly Shonen Jump, for instance, of all time, like the, the worst characters of all time, and the character that was number one in Weekly Shonen Jump that was the worst, certified the worst, apparently by people voting for it, was Ochiko. Now, oh, okay, look, 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 okay? I'm not going to say Ochiko is the best character of all time. I'm not going to say that at all. I won't. I, I'm, I know there's many out there that love different female characters at Boku no Hero Academia over her. I'm fine with that. But here's the thing. She is supposedly the worst female character in Shonen Jump. The worst. Just put those words together. The worst female character in Shonen Jump. Apparently... That's who Ochiko is, to uh, some readers of Weekly Shonen Jump. And I'm like, how the fuck is she the worst? I can name many. I'm not going to say them because I don't want to piss certain individuals off. But there's many characters out there that are just absolutely fucking horrible. I fucking hate these certain characters in Shonen. And just to see how Ochiko is number one when she is... She honestly has legit romance, actual build-up with actual good character development and is not a fucking plot device. I I'm actually, I like her character. Now, I I'm just going to say something, okay? How much you want to bet the reason why Ochiko is number one as certified the worst a Weekly Shonen Jump female character is probably because fans that like the other female characters of the manga series got salty as Fuck because they don't like Ochiko and they don't want the Ochiko and Deku pairing at all. So they are probably voted her down to make her the worst character because they don't like the pairing between Deku and her. I'm willing to bet you it's something along the lines of that because that, that really it kind of rustles my jimmies a little bit. I, I, I gotta admit, I'm a little bit salty. I mean, at the end of the day, it's someone's personal opinion. I understand that. But when it's, you know, just a big fucking poll on the entirety of, like, the news and all that or, you know, on the internet and you get to see how many people voted for this, I'm like... There's just many out there that are hell of a lot worse. I mean, look at this. The, one of the biggest abominations that was in the top five of the, supposedly the worst was that Kagura from Gintama was in the top five. Wor yo, yo, I'm not even going to touch that can of worms. I'm, I'm not going near that. Just saying Kagura is in the top five. Wor I, I just want to regurgitate just from hearing that. But anyways, let's talk about this chapter. Okay, enough of that. Let, let's just get off of that. Let's talk about this chapter of Boku no Hero Academia. Okay, so... To get right into it, let's just talk about Deku and his development. So Deku comes to realization in this chapter that he realizes if he would have cared more about himself of not injuring himself, like he's always been aware that he injures himself, he's been fully aware of that, but if he would have cared more of trying to avoid these injuries and would have known his limitations, he could have possibly have stopped certain things from happening in the series. Maybe All Might fighting one for all like he did. And Deku blamed himself in this chapter and realizes if he would not have pushed himself to where he broke all of his limbs, he would be able to help some people out later on down the road. And so he needs to come to terms so that he needs to understand that he has limits and he is not an invincible Superman that continuously goes at it with no limits at all. He does have limits, his bones can shatter, and even though he's got these upgrades, he's changed his fighting style, he still has his limits. And he realizes this, and he thinks about this in his head, like, I need to start being smarter about this. And this is a very good sign of character development and how he's evolved from his previous mentality of how he always was in the earlier portions of Boku no Hero Academia, when he would rush in and save anyone, and when he would probably break a bone in his body just to save them. I mean, Deku's still going to be Deku. He's still going to go out of his way to save someone. I I don't think that's ever going to change. He's still going to do ever, anything he wants when it comes to saving someone, but he realizes now he needs to be a little bit more 
careful when it comes to how he moves about. He doesn't want to shatter every bone in his body to where he can't help someone else out if they're right in front of them and, you know, he can't even move. He wants to be able to help as many people as he can, but also he doesn't want to be in that position to where he literally is broken, but then he sees someone and die in front of him. He, he wants to be able to move constantly. So I like the development he got and how he came to terms with he realizes one of the big problems he's been having and how he constantly misjudged what he could do and how he thought sometimes he might be limitless or he tried to break his limits when he really he can't go past those at this time. So that was some very good stuff in this chapter. Now getting off of that we get a little bit of a description on Deku's upgrade when it comes to his boots of how it kind of hits the wall or hits certain things and how it can go through it. I like that description. It adds a very good layer to uh, Izuku's character and I actually respect that because not many manga can actually really dive into certain details of power-ups or how a character changes their style. I mean, some manga could do. I mean, some manga definitely do do something like that, but not a lot do in this day and age. And I'm really happy to see that we got a little bit of an explanation on how Deku's new outfit works, especially with how he attacks with his legs now, and to see how he broke through the wall. That makes me happy. That does make me definitely happy to see these little details. It's just the little details, attention to detail, that really counts and makes the manga just so much better. That's why I love the characterization on these side characters, because it makes the series just so much more enjoyable, because you can appreciate the entirety of the bigger picture, and so just the main male character. So seeing these little details, that also is a very good point of this chapter. So enough of that, let's get into one of the crucial points, and one of the big points about this chapter is definitely the ending. When you see how this character, that's from this notorious high school, was doing misdirection, or playing mind games with Izuku throughout the entirety of this chapter. Now, as we know, in the last week's chapter, we saw it to where she disappeared. Like, you know, we had to where, like, she just quickly vanished, and then she just slammed the ball into Izuku's target. And then it looked like, you know, she just appeared out of nowhere. Like, she had some form of teleportation quirk or something, or maybe she was diving into the ground, and then she popped up. And, I mean, that's still a possibility. I mean, we do find out she has some form of slimish look at the end of the chapter, which, most likely, it's because she's shape-shifting. But, I mean, there is a possibility maybe she's, like, some form of a slimish type being, and so maybe she could, like, put herself into the ground and then maybe come out of it and all that, and that's kind of what she was doing. But regardless of whatever the methods may be, she was playing mind games with Izuku throughout the entirety of this chapter. When she would throw the ball, she would make it to where Izuku would focus his eyes on the ball, and then as he was looking at the ball, she would vanish. And she got, gave us a brief description, kind of, what she was doing. She was letting us know that when Izuku pretty much stopped looking at her, he stopped thinking about everything, and you just took his mind off her for a second to look at something else, that's what she quickly vanished and there's many card tricks or different magic tricks people do to, uh, that use stuff like this like I mean think about this we even see something like this in a recent anime of 91 days if you watch the anime from this recent anime season there's even an episode that focuses on the main character to where he plays some mind games where he does a magic trick with cards and how he's like you just got to use simple misdirection you got to make it to where someone you know looks at something else like let's say you have a pretty tie or something and you want that person to focus in on the tie you want them to focus on the tie instead of looking at your hand which is maybe shifting around a card or shifting around a coin or something. So that's kind of what she was doing in this chapter. She was making sure Izuku was focusing in on other things instead of her, and then she got to quickly change her location and get behind him or change her position in the battlefield. So it wasn't necessarily a teleportation or anything like that. It was just using simple tricks that normally people would use in everyday life if you're like a magician or, a, you know, someone that likes to use card tricks or something or play mind games and so on. That's some of the stuff you would do. So I actually I actually really like this tactic. It's very different from what you would normally see in the shonen because a lot of mangaka when they write something like this, especially with the character just appearing right in front of a character, usually they want to throw it in as some form of teleportation or some quick speed or something like that. And I'm not going to throw that off the table. I'm not going to say that she isn't fast. I'm just saying majority of mangaka would try to make it to where the character has an ability is why this is happening. But seeing how a character is able to play these mind games with Izuku and actually overcome him in some ways makes me happy because it's not just about quirk abilities, it's about how to use your mind and outsmart certain individuals and that's once again what we get to see which is one of the biggest qualities of Boku no Hero Academia and that would be using your mind, strategies and tactics instead of just being 
you know, beating the shit out of each other constantly, what we normally see in Shonen. So seeing this makes me happy as well, just seeing how we got these Maya games that were playing with him. So talking about the ending part of the chapter, she was turning into some form of slimish being and turning into her original face. Now, the best way you could kind of summarize that is she has some form of shape-shifting type of ability. I mean, look, she turned into Ochiko, and then as she was Ochiko, she was trying to find out more about, you know, Izuku, and then try to, you know, hit his target and get close to him. And the way I see it, the way I see her entire character now, I feel like the reason why she wanted to know more about Izuku is probably because she wanted to know more about him before she could shapeshift into him. Think about this, okay? One of the biggest things you want to do if you want to be a duplicate or whatever, if you want to be someone that's a shapeshifter, is you need to know more about that person. It, you see this common, like, it's very common in, like, shapeshifting type stories or people that change appearances. You see it to where a character's like, okay, I'm in a situation, I look like this main male character, I, I don't really know how he does his day-to-day -day activities, I don't know what he, how he would react in these certain situations, I don't know what he would do at this certain point with these certain people, and so what she's trying to do is, is that I want to know more about this person, for when I do shapeshift into them, I know how to react, That that's what she's trying to do, so it's not merely that she's crazy for Izuku and wants him, and as a love interest, she actually just wants to know more about him, because her quirk ability is most likely shapeshifting, and because she wants to know more details for when she could shapeshift into people, she could possibly shapeshift into him and fool people around, you know, that actually trust in Izuku because she knows how Izuku acts. And that's also what's going on with Ochiko. One of the biggest things uh, that really made her fail was that she didn't know the true entirety of Ochiko and didn't understand how Ochiko really was as a person. And that's what caused her to fail her entire disguise in this chapter. So what she's trying to do is find out more information about individuals for she can become them and shapeshift into them and then probably use that ability to target others and then take them out and then get her points, her target points. So it's a very smart thing. I really like that also to just to see how she's using her ability. It's more like a, I guess, a hobby. Just learning about more people, becoming a stalker for you can actually shapeshift into them and become them. It's something you see commonly in stories like this or, you know, these type of themes. So it's nothing, I guess, entirely original, but I do like the way it was showcased. It was very tasteful. So, one last thing to dive into. Let's talk about Deku and how he negated Ochiko and he slapped her hand away. This, I feel like, is going to probably not be noticed by many. Many are probably not going to notice this scene as much as I did. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but the way the scene was done was something that was so uncommon in Shonen, I actually was flabbergasted. Think about this for a second, okay? Majority of characters, not even in Shonen, but Shoujo and other series, even mature series, when you have it to where, let's say, a female character is being disguised as, or like someone's disguising themselves as the female character's appearance, okay? Ochika. And the main male character has some form of feelings or he's close to them, okay? Usually, the main male character can't even harm them, okay? And I like how Izuku was able to slap Ochika away and put aside you know, irrational thought and think rationally about what was going on here. He slapped away her hand, he already had his doubts that, you know, she is definitely not Ochiko, but he still saved her to begin with, but still on top of that, he didn't allow her to use him to the point to where he would lose this battle. And so seeing how he did that, he slapped away her hand, it lets us know that he won't let images of people get to him. He won't let someone, let's say, disguising as someone else, get to him and play mind games with him to win. He might save you, but he will not, he will not stop from probably pushing you aside or attacking you if you are indeed a villain. So seeing that too, that's another quality of Izuku's character that was displayed in this chapter, which not many shonen characters have. I mean, majority of shonen characters, if they saw, you know, the main female character with it, like, you know, so, uh, her appearance on someone else, they more most likely wouldn't attack her, or they most likely, even if they knew it was a fake, they wouldn't attack her because they just don't want to harm her because of the way her image looks. So I like the way this was also done, too, in this chapter. It's another way to kind of describe Izuku and how he kind of, you know, differs from other shonen characters. Now, I know I said one last thing a second ago, but this, this is literally the last thing, because this is something very important, which is a very fatal flaw in Izuku's entire style now, which is very apparent in this chapter. Now, I highly doubt I'm the only one to notice this, but I'm going to, you know, talk about it. Izuku saved, okay, saved her. Even though he had his guess that she wasn't, in fact, Ochiko, he still saved her. That is a big weakness. That is a very, very, very big weakness. If a smart villain, someone like, for instance, All for One, 
was to actually know about this and learn about this trait of Izuku, that would mean that this could be used against him to where he couldn't fight. Because, look, where Izuku will save anyone. He will go out of his way to grab them and save them, even if he knows that maybe there's a hunch that it's not the person he thinks it is. This could set him up for a possible trap in the future of the series. Maybe not 10 chapters from now, maybe not 50 chapters. If the series goes on for another 200 chapters, I could see where a villain might use this to probably attack Izuku in the future. Maybe Shigaraki, he might do something like that. I could see maybe he might try to attack Izuku in that way. But we'll have to see. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. You all have a wonderful day or night wherever you live. Please be safe. Chibi out.